I heard this godforsaken scream, and it was Bob, and he had Angie in his hands. He had found her in the pool. And I said, call 911, Angie's dead. She drowned. I didn't have the faintest idea what to do, nothing. I was lost. And I felt so helpless because there was nothing I could do. There was nothing I could, Bob was doing what he could do. And I was really scared, real scared. I laid her down on the ground on her back and I tried to breathe in her mouth and water came out her nose and splashed me in the face. Once that water came out, I figured I'd try the breathing again. This time I bent her neck back a little bit, pinched her nose off and I started breathing. And uh, you know, I could see her chest go up and down. It was the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. Then uh, she started squirming a little bit. I put my ear down to her chest again and, and there was the heartbeat and the paramedics walked in the gate at that very moment. I always watched 911, but uh, I didn't know I was watching this show and learning something at the same time. But I'm sure that gave me enough confidence that I could do what I did. No question about it. That Bob gave her mouth to mouth made all the difference in Angie's life. I have a lot to be thankful for. We're a family again. We got our little girl back. The action taken by people who happen to be at the scene of an emergency can make the critical difference whether or not a victim lives long enough to get to medical care. On the afternoon of September 24, 1991, 17-year-old Stephen Boland was at his parents' home in Fairfax, South Carolina, when his friend Ricky Grubbs made an unexpected visit that would change their lives forever. Seventeen-year-old Ricky came by at around four o'clock. Hey man, what's happening? I was over there at Steve's house just talking to him. And Steve noticed my mom's gun, so he asked to see it. He was just pointing at the ground the first time. And then shot it, and it didn't go off. Then he pulled the hammer back, and then shot it and it didn't go off again. They yeah, shot it twice. Stephen's 19-year-old brother Michael was inside the house when Ricky ran and told him about the shooting. Hurry up, come on, come on outside. I didn't know whether to believe him or not. He says, it's not a joke, it's not a joke. There's so much blood on the ground. I thought he was dead then. I remember seeing on Rescue 911 put pressure on the wound, stop the bleeding. He knew exactly what to do. Mike told me to put pressure where the hole was, where the bullet went in, which I did. While Ricky applied pressure to the wound, Michael ran to get his mother, Billy Joe, and call for help. He said, Mama, I've stopped the bleeding. And the urgency in his voice, and I knew that it was something bad. I felt like I was in slow motion and I couldn't get there fast enough. I was paralyzed with fear. I was so afraid for him. And I looked and saw all this blood and I said, this is my child and he's going to die. Can you hear me? Just keep breathing. Can you hear me? He's not saying anything. He's not saying anything. Breathe, man. Is he moving? Breathe. No, he hasn't moved. All I thought of was I've got to get blood back to his brain. I've got to somehow. Hold on, man. You're going to be fine. Breathe. Breathe. Ricky had his hand in the spot that Michael told him to put it. And I don't know how much blood he lost, but I knew that it was enough that if we didn't get help, he wasn't going to live. And I started saying, praying to God. I said, God, do something. You can't let this boy die, not, not my baby. Before the paramedics got there, I was trying to get him to you know, squeezed my hand or something. I was telling him to hang on, yelling at him to, to stay. Michael held his arms up and he said, Buddy, whatever you do, come on, buddy, don't leave me.
Within 10 minutes, the Allendale County Rescue Squad arrived on the scene. Stevens' condition was critical. He was quickly loaded into the ambulance for transport to the local hospital. All I could think of was, my child, he's going to die. And I don't know what to do. I just said, I don't want to lose my baby. I don't, I don't want him to go like this. This isn't right. This isn't his time. It's wrong. He shouldn't die before me. You know, nobody should lose their child. The bullet had severed the right internal carotid artery in Stephen's neck and lodged near his spinal cord. He was partially paralyzed and unable to breathe on his own. Stephen's father, William, arrived as his son was being loaded into the helicopter to be taken to the Medical University of South Carolina for emergency surgery. From that point and the ride from Fairfax to Charleston, I was hopeful but I was afraid. I didn't think that I was going to see my son alive. Seventeen-year-old Stephen Boland was hospitalized for three months. He continues to undergo intense physical therapy to regain full use of his left leg and left arm. In the years since the accident, he has made remarkable progress. I remember I couldn't move anything and I was just so scared I was going to be like that for my life. And to me, that would probably be worse than death. I know it'll take a lot of hard work to get it back, and that's what I plan on doing. Several things were done right in this case. The people with him knew what to do immediately to get direct pressure on the gunshot wound as soon as they found it. If he had lost maybe one or two more pints of blood, he might have had a much worse result. Afterwards, I was just in shock. I felt I was to blame. But I came out of the hospital, and he said, I know it wasn't your fault. And that really made me feel better. Guns are, in my opinion, bad things. That's a touchy subject, but it'll take a life as quick as, as you can blink your eyes and keep them out of reach where accidents won't happen. As a nurse, I know that had it not been for Michael learning how to apply pressure to a wound that he watched on Rescue 911, Stephen very well could have bled to death. That was a very, very important part, one of which we will always be grateful for.